All right, people are coming into the chat. Okay, I see it. We have uh, we have close to 500 people RSVP'd um, and people are coming in. I see 71, 73, 77. Okay, welcome. So for those of you who are here early or on time, um, I'm Billy Wimsat from Movement Voter Pack, and um, want to give everyone a, a welcome assignment to uh, introduce yourself in the chat. You can say your name, where you're from, something you're excited about in 2023, and just introduce yourself, rep where you're from, and think about one person. This is going to be an amazing, amazing program. I'm so excited for it. So think about one person who might want to join. Um, oh, there's my mom. Hey, mom, you want to come uh, join? This is Barbara Horberg. I'm visiting them here in Chicago. Say hi, mom. Hey, y'all. Yeah. I'm so so God. think of so, your mom, your friend, Someone needs to be here with you to experience this because after it's going to be like a good movie, you're going to want to talk about it afterwards with someone. So think about who is that special person. It's not too late to invite them. Mm -hmm. And I am going to dive right in. There is no such thing as an off year, y'all. It is 2023, you know, and we all need a rest. We, we all need a break. But there is no such thing as an off year. The work we do this year, the seeds we plant, it's like planting a garden in the spring. There's no harvesting unless you do the work to plant the seeds and take care of them and grow grow that garden. So we are going to be growing this garden together. And we're so happy to have you all with us. Just want to take a second to thank everyone on the call. You know, the people who show up on these calls, tend to be like just the best people in the world <laughs> who are loyal donors, new donors, friends of donors who have been supporting this work. So when you hear about this work today, I just want you to feel a sense of like deep, deep pride with for and everything that our partners are doing and everything that you have done already to contribute to it. And we're just gonna keep growing this movement together. So we have an amazing program and I, I want to start with this slide because we're going to go deep dive uh, case studies in in three states. But I wanted to zoom out first and just remind people the most important thing right now in everything we're doing is we're 17 months out from the 2024 election. And a lot can happen in the next 17 months, right? There's so many X factors, so many things we can't control. The economy, the war, the Republican primary, Biden's health, candidate recruitment, climate disasters, God knows what else, right? There's so many things that we don't control. So, and luck favors the prepared, right? Luck favors the prepared. So, the most important thing that we can do in 2023 in this supposed off year is to support our local partners to prepare for anything, to build their capacity to be prepared for anything. And smart money, smart money, y'all, is all about investing early in our partners to be prepared for anything. And no matter how it goes, you know, we already know. Biden, Harris, Jared Brown, John Tester, all these candidates, they are not going to win by themselves, y'all. They're not going to win by themselves. They're going to need extraordinary youth turnout, BIPOC turnout, and trusted messengers who are having those one-to-one -one conversations at scale with tens of millions of voters to say, are you prepared for election day? Are you bringing your family? Do you did you get your mail in ballot? Oh wait, you like Trump? Let's have a conversation about that. Who are having those one to one conversations? That the unseen heroes who are having those tens of millions of conversations, the hundreds of organizations doing that work, and the tens of thousands of staff and volunteers who are having those conversations. Those are the people who are going to win in 2024 because the candidates might not inspire everyone to get out to vote this time, y'all, right? So the deep capacity 
and investment, investment in capacity building in all of our 2024 states. And, and just to, to say a quick something about this map, it overlays the little maps on the, the left side are um, overlaying in the big map. So this, what you're seeing is the overlay of the presidential, the Senate, the house, as far as we know it right now, and state level races. And I wanna mention a few key races in 2023 we're not gonna talk about today. The next big one, is Pennsylvania, May 16th. And, you know, 2023 is a year, you know, we just had Wisconsin. We're about to celebrate that. We're going to hear all about that. We're going to have Virginia in the fall. And there's some other really important races, Kentucky governor's race, et cetera, et cetera. But I want to mention this Pennsylvania, May 16th Democratic primary because it's not on almost anyone's radars nationally. Pennsylvania is unique among swing states in having most of their local and county level races in 2023. And a lot is decided at the county level. Election deniers could be elected at the county level and, demo and champions of voting could be elected at the county level. So there are, in, especially in the big counties, in Philly, in Allegheny County where Pittsburgh is, there's people on the ballot, um, Helen Gim, in, uh, who's amazing movement candidate that came out of um, one of our amazing local organizations in, in Philly, is running for mayor. If we have someone like her, if we have someone um, like who's the equivalent of her in Allegheny County, running the voting process, um, and determining the budgets for voting machines. How many voting machines? How many early vote locations? How is the how are the counties getting involved in supporting people to vote? These are really critical, smart, structural things that that can be determined on May 16th, 2023, that will have a big impact when we're looking at, at the news on election night of how many votes are coming in from Philly and Pittsburgh, right? So we want to do the smart upstream things looking ahead because so much of this you know the news is is coming at us um and what we want to be in is the business of making the news of determining the news of looking ahead and determining the course of history before it happens and then watching the headlines that we made instead of responding you know we don't want to be on pins and needles about the supreme court and whether they're going to uphold the ban on you know, abortion drugs, you know, by the time you're watching the news and seeing if the Supreme Court is gonna, gonna ban abortion pills, it's way too late. That means we already lost several elections that put people on the Supreme Court that put us in this situation. So we wanna get ahead of the curve, right? So when people ask us, you know, what are you doing about abortion rights? What are you doing about the climate crisis? What are you doing about these mass shootings? The, the framework that people have about how to solve issues has, has been in these issue silos that implies that we're gonna solve these things through some national policy strategy. For the most part, that's not how it works. All of these policies are determined largely by elections at the state and local level, right? How, how are we gonna win on abortion? How are we gonna win on climate? These are state and local fights that are, de that are determined by who controls these states, right? Except for the things that are determined at the federal level, which are also determined at the state and local level, right? Did we win this Senate seat? Did we win this presidential race to appoint the judges? we wanna get upstream. Everything comes down to these upstream strategic interventions at the state and local level right now when it's not urgent, right? Three months before the election, everyone's gonna feel the urgency. We need to feel that same level of urgency now because now is when it's strategic to invest. Three months before the election, still helpful, not nearly as helpful, not nearly as smart as doing that now. And we have an opportunity this year and next year to get ahead of the curve, to determine the news before it happens, to determine the course of history before it happens. 
17 months from now, we could be sitting with a Republican trifecta with a Trump or DeSantis or Tim Scott, Nikki Haley, whoever, trifecta driving us down into a terror zone of, of autocracy and, and apoc apocalyptic terribleness that will take us decades to, to recover from if we could even recover. 17 months from now, we could be in that situation or we could win a trifecta and we could, could have an even better situation that um, in 2025, where we're legislating, where we're able to pass policies that we weren't able to pass in 2021 because we finally have the votes. So tonight we are gonna, um, so investing in these states, in these groups right now is important. And I, what we wanna do tonight is go deep in three case studies from three really different situations in three really different um, states. And I wanna introduce two really exciting people on the MVP team who y'all haven't met yet. Um, our two newish senior state strategy directors, Javier Morillo and um, Sarah Chasen Warner. And they are both so awesome. I'm so excited to, to introduce y'all to them. And they're going to facilitate conversations with some of our groups. And just to give you a sense of who they are. So they, they share management of our state advisors who are based in the states. So Javier has the Midwest and the Southwest from, from uh, you know, Wisconsin, Michigan, Texas, Arizona uh, zone. And, and Sarah, oh, so Javier is going to first do the report back on Wisconsin, which we're all so excited to hear from, and is going to talk about, um, is going to talk with uh, uh, our special guest uh, from Minnesota, Doran Schrantz, about what happens when you win a trifecta, um, all the amazing things that you do and all the, what comes from that and what's next. So, so you're going to first hear from Javier um, talking with, with Priscilla and Doran about Wisconsin and Michigan. And then you're going to hear from Sarah, who has the whole Eastern seaboard from Maine and New Hampshire down to Florida and Georgia. And she's going to facilitate a really kind of visionary strategic conversation, uh, the likes of which we've never really done before with four of our amazing ally leaders from Florida who've been living under the Ron DeSantis autocracy um, and talking about the strategy they have for countering Ron DeSantis both in Florida and countering him nationally so that he doesn't turn the whole country into Florida. And you know, I'll just say, we don't know if it's gonna be Ron DeSantis or Trump or who, who knows, but we need, this is a visionary strategy because we basically now understand the Trump playbook, but we haven't yet had to figure out what is the post-Trump MAGA playbook um, for countering Trumpists who are not Trump. So this DeSantis conversation has multiple levels of significance for Florida, for the country, and for our overall strategy. and. Um, Again, we're thinking way ahead because why? Luck favors the prepared. So without further ado, I'm gonna pass it to Javier uh, to, and and Javier, I, I just wanna say a teeny bit about Javier, uh, who's so like kind of was a hero of mine even before we met um, because Javier did something really incredible in Minnesota, which you're gonna hear more about. He was the president of a local SEIU labor union that had a campaign to raise the minimum wage. And instead of just being like, oh, we're the big labor union, we're gonna, we'll, we'll just use that money and do it ourselves. Javier was like, you know what? We're not gonna do it ourselves. We're gonna do it with all of our allies and built a model in Minnesota that we actually studied when we were building the strategy for MVP where he brought all the community groups to the table and said, we wanna support all the community groups in Minnesota to do big things together, to do bigger things together as a, as a true team. And that's the Minnesota model, the Minnesota miracle, um, we used to call it uh, you know, back, back in the day, um, that really 
that really was a model that um, that all of us around the country studied that isn't just about like, let's support one awesome group in a state to do an awesome thing. It's about how do we support collaborative state ecosystems over time to, to, to dramatically transform their states. So it's great to have you here, um, Javier, and, um, and I will pass it to you. Midwest. Yes. <laughs> Thanks so much, uh, Billy. I, I love every opportunity to boast about the, the Midwest. So uh, welcome, everyone. I'm uh, just really proud to be a part of MVP. Uh, I've been uh, been here a few short months, but I'm super excited. Um, as Billy said, my name is Javier Morillo, and I am one of the two senior state strategy directors. You'll meet both of us. And we have the privilege of working with the people who I consider the magic sauce of our work at Movement Voter Project. That is our state advisors. Those of you who might be familiar with how, how philanthropy works, there's often foundations where program officers sit in offices, and then once a year, they go and do a site visit um, to, to meet with groups that they fund. Our model is, is very different. Um, the way we resource uh, groups is through our state advisors, and state advisors come from movement, they are embedded in movement, um, and we expect them to be, and they are, in relationship with the folks on the ground um, because they are building year-round because we know that's what it takes uh, to, to, to win big, is to build um, uh, year-round. Um, this approach is near and dear to my heart because, as, as Billy mentioned, I've, I've been in the work of state power building for a long time. For 14 years, I was president of SEIU Local 26, a union of janitors, security officers, and other service workers. And besides the work of the union, I think the thing that I'm most proud of is the work of alignment that Billy referenced that we did collectively with, um, with our movement partners here to build an ecosystem that allowed us, the individual groups, to grow their own capacities to scale what, collectively. And then when you do that, your, your asks get bigger and your chances of winning things get, uh, get, are greater and the, the wins that you have uh, are bigger. And we're going to actually hear about uh, some of those from, from one of those, those movement leaders. But tonight I'm talking uh, not just about Minnesota, but, uh, but about the, the, the Midwest. And we're going to talk um, with, uh, um, go a little deep on two states in, in particular. I want to say first a, a, little, a word about the Midwest, and I hope it doesn't trigger too many awful memories to go back to 2016, when you all might remember that the Midwestern states, particularly Michigan, Wisconsin, and Minnesota, were considered the Clinton firewall, that, that these were going to be the states that were going to keep Donald Trump from being president. And we, we all know how that, how that ended up. Um, uh, the, Trump won narrowly, but won Wisconsin and Michigan, and and Hillary Clinton just barely won Minnesota. It shocked people everywhere, and especially those of us here on the ground. And in all of the Midwest, people like leaders have been clawing their way back. Um, and we're going to hear from some uh, some of the successes because they are very dramatic. Just two weeks ago. Our partners in Wisconsin accomplished a monumental task. I would say they may have saved our republic. Um, they this they've been working since Scott Walker um, devastated that state. And I would say I, I'm, I'm Minnesota, and and we're the neighbors. Uh, they are our neighbors to the east, and it has been it was a heartbreaking thing to see. And I thought it would be decades before we were able to see Wisconsin um, be back to what it what it was. But that's not what our movement partners uh, in Wisconsin thought. They thought, hell no, we are gonna fight back now and we're gonna build now. And that's what they've done. And last week they flipped their Supreme Court to a pro-choice anti-gerrymandering majority. Um, and uh, and may very well have, as I said, saved our our republic because when uh, when cases uh, inevitably um, uh, in in future elections and in 2024 when when sore losers again claim fraud needlessly and um, and and falsely uh, and go to the Supreme Court, we will have a majority who respects the law and respects democracy, and we will have that majority in Wisconsin because incredible leaders and organizations um, have have drilled down to do the work, the year-round work. And we're going to hear now 
from one of those leaders, the movement political uh, movement politics director of Citizen Action Wisconsin, Priscilla Bort, to tell us how they did it. Take it away, Priscilla. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Billy, Javier, Sarah, uh, for the wonderful overview conversation tonight. Um, I'm just, I'm so excited. Oh, Jesus. A big, big thank you to the Movement Voters Project Hold for Home tonight. I do need to quickly shout out the dearest, dearest Rima Mod for holding down MVP as Wisconsin State Advisor, just being an incredible supporter and friend, like all of the MVP staff. Uh, there is no such thing as an off year. A thousand percent right. My name is Priscilla. I use she, her pronouns. I live in the great city of Milwaukee. I'd also be remiss if I didn't quickly say Bucks and Six because they're playing right now. Uh, and I am the Movement Politics Director for Citizen Action of Wisconsin. Uh, so just two weeks ago, we had an incredible night here in the state electing that pro pro-abortion and reproductive rights, pro-union judge to the state Supreme Court with Janet Protasiewicz, her victory, the work of so many progressive organizations here on the ground, is that first step in removing the many, many pieces that still remain of Scott Walker's terrible legacy. Uh, during Scott Walker's time as governor, he made really good use of that time, from cutting the rights of workers and the rights of their unions, to creating these shady backroom deals with groups like Foxconn that never had plans to fulfill promises, uh, his appointments and the elected officials that chose to work closely with him continue to make Wisconsin a less fair state, working solely for those wealthy and well-connected few instead of the very constituents that they represent. We saw it not only here in the state, but nationally. As the January 6th committee works to hold Wisconsin's fake electors accountable, those fake electors are still so proud of the work they did and continue to do. Just, just last year, they bragged about how much they were able to suppress Black and Brown Wisconsinites' votes. But that being said, let's talk about and celebrate what just happened two weeks ago and set the stage for what's going to be an eventful and exciting 2024. Uh, we knew early on that all eyes would be on the state Supreme Court race, especially coming off of a devastating Senate loss in 2022. This was going to be our best chance to flip the court from a conservative to a liberal majority. The court wrapped up their gerrymandering, throwing out any and all versions of anything close to fair maps. They had been strong in upholding Wisconsin's 1849 ban as the as Roe got overturned. Uh, and since the next court race in 2025 is a liberal judge up for re-election, this was our chance right now. Candidates that made it through the primary, Janet Protasewicz on our side, and Scott Walker's buddy Dan Kelly on the other, uh, set the stage. This race was going to be about abortion and reproductive rights. Every week as we would deep canvas on the doors and the phones, we would hear voters talk about abortion and health care and what it meant to them, how frustrated they were that Dan Kelly did not agree with any exceptions to abortion. Our deep canvas model, where we listen to voters instead of just throwing talking points at them, gave us a chance to hear stories across the state. Uh, one example that I really, really want to share uh, was that a voter who had always voted conservative, but was hesitant to do so this time because of Dan Kelly's stance on abortion and his overall character. Um, after our volunteer had a conversation with them, they decided to vote for Janet, even though they didn't fully agree with her stance on abortion. They knew that they could not vote for Dan Kelly's stance against it. But that's how Wisconsin flipped. These real conversations, treating voters, they are people first, since they are people, and listening to them, bringing them in without judgment. And that's how we build power across the state. We allow people to express and think through their values without judgment. 
and it's hard sometimes it's emotional work and yeah there's times where you just want to shout please vote the way i want you to vote please but that's again that's not how we build power we build power by listening by showing voters that they have a say beyond their vote they can run for office, they can volunteer, they can campaign manage it, they can call their legislatures, both the good and the bad, and hold them accountable. And we can't just do this during the big years, during those midterms, presidentials, we have to do it. There is odd off years and all year round. It's how we show voters that they are more than voters, that they're people. I don't ever want to just have conversation with somebody because I want them to vote a specific way. I want to talk to them now in May and June when the governor and the legislature are working on the state budget in August when schools when went back to school that we can talk about what funding of public schools looks like and should look like in December when the weather gets cold and the energy companies are trying to figure out how to make heating as hard as possible for residents. And of course, these odd off years are also a great time to look ahead. So let's talk about 2024 and beyond. First things first, a Janet win does mean that we can get new maps. It also means that Dan Kelly will not have a chance to decertify the 2024 presidential results in Wisconsin when a Republican does not win because they're not going to. We can throw out these gerrymandered districts have real competitive races across the state, the way that races were meant to be in the first place. Plain and simple, we need more progressive folks to step up and get involved to fill those seats, to run, to campaign manage, to help get candidates across the line. Uh, only did we see that big statewide victory. We also saw a great down ballot ones. Uh, Wisconsin future is a lot brighter, not only because of what happened on April 4th, just two weeks ago, but because of folks like MVP and all of you on this call and your continued support. Our program is sustained by MVP and thousands of small dollar donations across the country. And because we have, because that we haven't had to stop because just because the election cycle is over, we've been been hitting doors and phones with our deep canvas for gathering support for a state budget that includes badger care and getting ready to make sure that that budget includes things that are actually going to help Wisconsinites. So thank you all so much for being, for listening, for celebrating, for continuing to stay invested in the work that we do of great leaders like MVP. We still have more work to do in Wisconsin, of course, but we're one step closer because of what just happened two weeks ago. Can't wait to see all the other victories that we're going to talk about tonight here on the call and everybody else who's up too. I'm excited to celebrate as you get the movement politics folks elected. Uh, if you're thinking for running for office, you're becoming a campaign manager, invest, donate. I can't wait to celebrate and support all of you. We don't need to wait for that midterm or presidential year. We can do it right now. So with that, um, I can't wait to celebrate some of your victories soon. And thank you for having me. Thanks so much, Priscilla. Um, I just love love your enthusiasm and just want to want to point out to everyone that Priscilla is here tonight, and I can't I can't even imagine how exhausted she is, and how exhausted all of our movement partners are in Wisconsin because they have not um, they've not been letting up because they they haven't been able to. Um, I know, and we all know that your victory was not just was not one in the last six weeks was not even just a part of this campaign. It's about long term investment in organizing, long term investment in movement building that you all do on the ground and that MVP, um, uh, what we try to support through by funding the way that we do. Want to underscore a uh, shout out that Priscilla gave to our state advisor, Rima Ahmad, um, who like all of our state advisors, as I said before, is embedded in movement, has the trust of leaders so that we know what folks need on the ground in real time and try to meet those needs. And um, as I said earlier, I love bragging about the Midwest and I am thrilled that our, that with this victory, Wisconsin will soon um, join Minnesota as a haven for reproductive rights in the Midwest because we are uh, sadly isolated on, on, on that front. Um, and um, sorry. Oh, sorry, Javier, sorry to jump in. I don't know if you saw these questions in the chat. I think we're okay on time. Um, and, and I just, um, 
Francis yes, McCoy. Yes. What what timeline do you see for overturning the abortion ban in the gerrymandered maps? And ASWS, is there any chance of the threatened impeachment of the new Supreme Court judge by the now supermajority Republican legislature? I think these are questions a lot of people are wondering. So just wanted to throw those. Sure. Yeah. Priscilla, you want to have at those? Sure. I was uh, typing out a response. So I'm happy uh, to, to talk about it. So Janet does not get sworn into uh, office until August. So we've got a couple months, uh, but our great law groups here in the state have already started moving uh, the motions to challenge the maps. Uh, so we can anticipate once she gets uh, in uh, sworn in and is official, not uh, judge elect more, but as uh, State Supreme Court Justice Janet Protasewicz, uh, we can anticipate that moving as as soon as uh, Tony Evers can get those maps and as soon as those challenges can move through the right courts on up to the State Supreme Court. So it's going to move as fast as possible, uh, but we are anticipating having these maps uh, ready for the fall of 2024. Uh, so it's going to move fast and we need it to move fast. Um, and, we've, you know, we, we've been ready. Uh, we've been hopeful that Janet was gonna gonna take it. We could get these maps back. So the state of Wisconsin has been ready. We don't have to wait around for anything. Um, and then as for the impeachment, um, the Republicans have given their word. I'm gonna use it in quotes because we all know what a Republican word uh, really is. They're not gonna plan to go about an impeachment route. Um, we're still watching it, uh, but right now they're all sidetracked with the state budget and what they're planning on getting from it, like funding for public schools, funding for Badger Care, and all those things that will help Wisconsinites. Uh, so as of right now, it's not something we're worried about, but of course we'll never take our eye uh, off of what they what they're planning on doing. But thankfully I think I pay right now. Uh, thanks so much, and thanks for those questions. And uh, and I, I we're all, I'm multitasking here, so uh, so Billy, please feel free to jump in, or anyone else, if uh, if I uh, uh, um, miss miss questions as we as we move on. Um, so uh, before introducing our next speaker, just a, you know, going to like for those of you who were on our last call might remember that we, had, we did a deep dive on Michigan, um, and there. Uh, our state advisor Jamila Martin um, uh, talked about the, about their recently won trifecta and about policy wins that you might have read about. In, uh, they, they passed got some gun control legislation. They pr right, protected reproductive rights. They overturned right to work and are bringing back Michigan as a union state. Um, and all of that's fantastic. But one of the things, one of the realities on the ground that we know from our from uh, from our movement partners uh, there is that because they this is the first trifecta pretty much in the state's history. There was one before, but it was very brief and um, and many and several decades ago. Um, but that our movement partners weren't ready to have a legislative agenda because why would you have one when you had a right wing uh, legislature? Um, they are working hard to to fix that. But I think also. Um, some what we can make a distinction between the, um, the some of the victories we're seeing in uh, in Michigan and what we're going to hear about in in uh, in Minnesota is that these are these are general pretty general like democratic priorities uh, being pro union being pro reproductive rights um, uh, fighting to fighting against the scourge of uh, of gun violence and illegal guns. Um, in Minnesota, we're seeing something uh, a little different, which is issues that that historically even Democrats have found to be too controversial to move on. Things like restoring the vote for um, for uh, felons who have done their, who have served their their time and are being reintegrated into society. Things like passing driver's licenses for all in the state, so that. Um, immigrants can get to work without fear of uh, of police, and um, these policy victories are driven by community. They are driven by movement organizations, and Minnesota has been has been making national headlines um, for for uh, for these huge wins. And so, I am thrilled to get you to introduce to you all a really really good friend. And I know people often say that when they're introducing uh, folks, but but this is the odd. Uh, Honest to God, truth. Uh, Dorn Trance is um, uh, who I refer to as my favorite co-conspirator 
uh, in, in Minnesota for years. We have worked together to help build our progressive ecosystem here. Um, she leads an organization um, uh, called Faith in Minnesota that she's going to be talking uh, about. But I'll just say that Dorn is one of the best organizers, not only in Minnesota, but in the country, is a visionary leader um, who leads not just a powerful organization, and she will tell you about that, but also uh, is focuses on building out an entire ecosystem. Because as you said before, when we invest uh, all year round, when we invest on, on, on years and off years, when we invest in movement building in getting progressive organizations to align and really build their state ecosystems, the end result is our asks get bigger and our victories get bigger. And to hear about that, uh, I'm going to pass it over to my good friend, Dorn Schrantz. That was the best introduction, Javier, ever. <laughs> Thank you. Um, again, my name is Doran Schrantz, and I am the director of um, Isaiah and Faith in Minnesota, but I'm going to be talking about Faith in Minnesota tonight. Uh, I am so excited to be here. I feel like I am with friends and we are like, you know, I, there's nothing I like more than talking about states, organizing, local power building, whether it's in Florida or Michigan or Minnesota or wherever states is where um, power happens. It's the front line of the most significant fights that we are having in this country about whether or not we're going to be a multiracial democracy and it's going to be won or lost in states. So I'm thrilled to be here. Um, so there is a lot going on in Minnesota, which I'm really excited to tell you about. It's pretty exciting and also fascinating. So what is happening in Minnesota? So these are a couple of headlines I want to share with you. One is a national headline, and it's apropos for your our, our case studies tonight, um, uh, which you're going to hear about Florida in a little bit. But there it was a national headline. Uh, Minnesota's Governor Tim Walz is the anti-DeSantis. Dems should take note. And then the second headline was on the front page of the Star Tribune, which is Minnesota's most significant mainstream newspaper. And this was about eight weeks into the legislative session, maybe maybe six weeks. And the headline was Minnesota Democrats rapidly advanced the most progressive agenda in a generation. So next slide. Um, so let me share with you a little bit what has passed and what is going to pass. Um, very shortly. So what has already passed and actually pa actually was passed out of both houses, both the House and the Senate, and then signed into law within the first two months, first hundred days of this legislative session was restore the vote, 100% clean energy by 2030, driver's licenses for immigrants, universal school meals for all public school children, both uh, for breakfast and for lunch, in both public schools and charter schools for every single child in the state of Minnesota, K through 12. And the PRO Act, establishing and enshrining reproductive justice and reproductive care into law. What is going to pass by the end of this session, uh, one of the most progressive paid family and medical leave bills uh, in the country, one of the most progressive uh, paid sick and safe time bills in the country, the Democracy for the People Act, which is automatic voter registration, pre-registration for 17 and 18 year olds, uh, uh, making it illegal to has, harass voters or election judges, um, money for community education and voter registration that goes directly to community organizations. We are, this is just one little snapshot, we are doubling the budget for childcare to 1.2 billion. We are establishing a new department um, for children and families, which will consolidate all programs um, from MFIP to child care to all youth programs into a new department. Um, we're going to put three to four billion new dollars into public K through 12 public education. And there are real progressive revenue and tax spending proposals on the table while we have a $17.5 billion surplus. The other things I want to add about this before we go to that next slide is there's a, this is like the headlines, but there's a couple of, I want to give a couple of snapshots of the kinds of things that are moving through the legislature because there are democratic caucuses in both the House and the Senate that are clear about an agenda. 
We are going to remediate every lead pipe in the state of Minnesota for $800 million, every single one. There will never be a flint in Minnesota. We are transforming the housing agency so that it actually does down payment assistance. There is money for down payment assistance, including interest-free down payment assistance for um, those who are Muslim across the state. And those are things that when we started this legislative session and we were like going in, I'm just talking about the down payment assistant, interest fee down payment assessment for people who are East African and Muslim. Um, we went in the first day and the legislator who was gonna author that said, you already won this bill, we're doing it. So the question becomes, why are the Democrats acting that way? Because for those of us who've been organizing, <laughs> 20 or 30 years, that just because they win doesn't mean they act that way. So what has happened over the last 10 or 15 years that has produced a Democratic, Democratic uh, elected officials, caucus, and our governor, Governor Tim Walls, who have been this aligned on a bold, clear governing agenda, regardless of what many would tell them could be disastrous political consequences? And I remember the last time we had a trifecta in 2013, the mantra of that trifecta was we can't overreach. And we left many of these things that are passing right now, they were left off the table. And right now, that's not the story. No one has breathed a word about overreach. So what's happened? So what every, uh, what, um, you know, we can go to the next slide. Everything is due, before I go through this, Everything is due to an ecosystem. So it is about 10 or 15 years of ongoing organizing and ecosystem building that has been about a whole family of organizations, grassroots, uh, grassroots organizing, people playing different roles in the ecosystem from labor to faith to grassroots community organizations. Um, but one of the things that I wanna name here, go back to the other, go back one slide. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go there, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but one of the things that has happened in the last seven or eight years that I want to specifically credit MVP and its theory of change. So one of the changes has been that grassroots community organizing organizations like mine have been able to build C4s and PACs and overt political power. And without the investment and the like, you know, leap of faith that Movement Voter Project made in groups like ours, building our, our C4, but also Unidos Minnesota, Land Stewardship Project, a whole host of organizations, building the kind of political power that is first and foremost rooted in not just winning an election, but advancing a governing agenda. So here's um, a little bit like the drunk history version <laughs> eight years, just to give you a snapshot of why this is so important. So in 2017, we launched our C4, Faith in Minnesota. Long time been organizing the state, but never had done overt political work. So we launched our C4, but with an agenda and a platform. And the whole thing was like, we have an agenda, we have a platform. This isn't about candidates. It's about our power and it's about politics to move our agenda. Uh, we did that in our six most important constituencies, went through a long process with them, East African, uh, Latino, uh, Kids Count on Us, which is our child care workers, Young Adult Coalition, Greater Minnesota, Rural Minnesota, built a platform. In 2018, there was an open seat for governor. We used that opportunity to organize. So what that looked like was sending 5,000 people with their platform along ourselves and along with some other organizations going into precinct caucuses and saying, we wanna shape whoever is the governor, we wanna shape their agenda. We emerged as a political force in the endorsement process, but again, around our agenda, which allowed us to build relationships with all the governor's candidates on the democratic side. And our, our mantra to them was, we need you to govern with an agenda that's as bold as the crisis in people's lives. Secondly, he won, he won the governor's seat that year, and, then the, and also the House uh, won the majority. And there's two things that happened. Because we had political power, we worked with the House on building something called the Minnesota Values Project. 
This was a strategic inside outside formation that new legislators asked organizations like Faith in Minnesota, like Unidos, like Labor, like Take Action Minnesota to come together to say, we actually want this to be about an agenda. We don't want to do what we did in the past. How do we organize year round together and move this platform through the legislature? So we practiced and rehearsed how to do that. So they passed actually in 2019, all the bills that we had on our platform and shared with other organizations. Then in 2020, we kept rehearsing this, partially with MVP and also to keep showing ourselves as a reliable political actor. We ran the largest volunteer voter engagement program in the state that year. Um, and uh, the Dems then took the House, but the GOP kept the Senate. Then in 2021, um, we uh, again advanced that platform further. So then we added pieces to it. So our House caucus basically already worked through, negotiated all these policy platforms, and we were right there. We didn't go away after the election. And what I mean by that is there was hundreds of people in legislative districts actually organizing with their legislators or preparing to flip a district. Then this is another major leap that MVP took with us. We launched Faith in Minnesota Action Pack in 2021. And that was so we could develop candidates for the state Senate alongside with them and with the party. So we aren't the party but we built our own program and we coordinated directly with the party in 10 Senate districts. And that didn't look like just doing voter contacts. We brought all of our lists, all of our staff, everybody over. And a couple of highlights from that is the Senate candidates and the House candidates who partnered with Faith in Minnesota Action Pack outdid their colleagues on door knocking, on grassroots fundraising, and on all of their texting, all of their volunteer engagement. So we, those candidates that were with us and all of our leaders outperformed and many of them won. And many of them were actually leaders from connected to us in our base. So now they're in the legislature. <laughs> so, so we go into this year where we have this trifecta, but what I wanna be clear about, it's a one vote majority in this Minnesota State Senate. So everyone would predict that how can you with a one vote majority, everyone in the Minnesota State Senate is freaking Joe Manchin if they wanna be. And yet somehow that Minnesota State Senate caucus and the Minnesota uh, Legislative Caucus, they have House and Senate files one, two, three, four, five, six, set all the way through 20 that are complete companions and align with the Minnesota Values Project agenda. So the new and the people who founded MVP and who were a part of these political programs are now the majority leader of the House, the majority leader of the Senate, the chair of the tax committee, the chair of Ways and Means. That's a little inside baseball, but these are the most powerful positions inside a state legislature, have been on this journey with us, with a set of organizations, hashing these things out, organizing between cycles. It is these things that have to be in place. Organizing between cycles, a whole ecosystem, a strategic inside outside formation, political power, not just doing politics, political power that accrues to community based organizations. They have to have political power in order to have governing power. So the kind of journey that Faith in Minnesota has been on many other organizations in Minnesota have been on. And it's the combination between organizations and constituencies, political power, direct candidate engagement, candidate pipelines, shaping and all built not just around winning an election, but about advancing a, a multiracial democratic governing agenda in the state of Minnesota. So there are, I can go to the next slide. So there are some lessons which absolutely are centered in the MVP like vision, but I just wanna name again, grassroots organizations have to have political power and in order for an organization to move to having some political power, it's gonna take multiple cycles. Mm -hmm. Grassroots organizations have to be about moving an agenda, not just um, 
an electoral outcome. It's essential that the political power that an organization builds, whether that's Wisconsin Citizen Action or Faith in Minnesota or Unidos or Florida Rising, that power has to accrue to that organization and not to a table or to a party or to a candidate. They have to have their own power. Deep partnerships with elected officials is essential to move an agenda. And they have to see those organizations in order to have that partnership, they have to see them as partners who have power. And lastly, I cannot underscore this like ecosystem question. <laughs> about inside outside strategic formations. I knew it was important, but I didn't know how important until my experience, even in the last three, three months, moving this agenda in partnership with our allies in the state legislature. So I'll close there. Thank you so much to all of you. And thank you so much to MVP. Doran, like, have y'all ever heard some shit like this? Like this is <laughs> what you just heard was like the most advanced, multi-layered, longitudinal movement power strategy. And there's a drug history version, but yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was amazing. That's like, like I, I hope people understand just how special that was, what you just heard. Um, and I wanna give a super shout out to Doran and Javier. We, we're gonna have like a extended convo, but, but I got us a little bit behind. Um, and I also just want to super shout out Laura Flynn, who co-created MVP nationally and um, and also built the MVP Minnesota strategy that 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 Doran's referring to. Um, and it has has been, you know, an MVP state advisor during all this this uh, period that the Doran described um, and, and is now working with Doran and others to develop a Midwest strategy. Um, Coming soon, you'll hear more about that. But just just want to super shout out Laura for the 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 really visionary, incredible partnership role. Oh, Laura's in the chat. She's here. Thank you, Laura. Good job. Um, and I just want to take a second to freaking cheer for um for Priscilla and Doran and all your colleagues and all your teammates. It, like I, I think this deserves a standing ovation. I want everyone, whatever you're doing, stand up, please. And <laughs> You know, I know you can't hear all of us clapping. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. I'm Billy like, Fong. What's your name? You know, this is like like the this the epic level of celebration we should be having right now. We cannot even I, I think about the videos I saw from inside the Minnesota legislature of of you know Unidos and the the immigrant um organizers when they won driver's licenses and just like the hugging and crying and cheering and oh you God. know and 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 the the 55,000 people who got their right their voting rights restored the hugging and cheering and crying for years and years of work that was made possible by all of your work and and just envisioning what y'all are going to do in Wisconsin so just this was a very special moment in history. I hope everyone like really took in how incredible um, this was and like, yeah, all the celebration, all the flowers. Um, and, and, and now we are going to pivot. Now to, we're going to beat Ron DeSantis. Yeah. Now we're going to beat Ron DeSantis. <laughs> um, yeah. My, my, my new metaphor is you guys remember Steve Bullock, the, uh, who is a popular Democratic governor of Minnesota, sorry, not Minnesota, of Montana, who ran for president and then now in, went back, lost in, in, lost president in the primary, lost in um, Montana, and now no one remembers who he is. So that's, that's Ron DeSantis's future after these brilliant Florida organizers get, get um, through with him. Um, so now I have the pleasure to introduce my amazing colleague, Sarah Chasen Warner, who is an incredible organizer, um, who's had many chapters, including most recently before coming to MVP, ran the donor table in New Hampshire. Um, so, so like really has thought deeply about um, every level of the game in a critical early primary state. Um, and is, was actually one of our partners um, before she came to MVP. And before that, 
um, was a, a high level campaigns person at People's Action. People's Action is the national network that's affiliated with Wisconsin Citizen Action. And she came up through this the um, US Action Network and through People's Action and is, is very modest and won't say this about herself, but is really one of the most expert people in the country at moving national policy through the states, you know, through early primary states like, you know, Iowa, New Hampshire, South Carolina, and moving issues on both the Republican and Democratic side. So anyway, if we have time, I actually want to hear your perspective beyond uh, Florida about about how we we move uh, the strategy, but um, but otherwise, just want to pass it to you to introduce our, our amazing, heroic Florida um, team. Thank you, Billy. I'm excited today to bring to you four of the most dynamic and strategic leaders in the state of Florida. Ray Paltry, who's the executive director of the Florida Alliance, which is the state's donor table. Nadine Smith, who's executive director of Equality Florida. Andrea Mercado, Executive Director of Florida Rising, and Josh Weirbeck, Executive Director of Florida Watch, which is the state's communications hub. So today, we're gonna have a discussion about the Florida threat. Ron DeSantis, who is quickly becoming a national threat to us all. And with an expected run for the presidency, Ron DeSantis wants to export his particular brand of culture war conservatism to the rest of the country. Ron DeSantis and the many other conservatives who are playing by the same playbook is a major threat to the future of our country. He won his first bid for Florida governor by a mere 30,000 votes and won his next bid by over a million votes. Bolstered by a lack of sustained investment in the progressive movement in Florida over the last 10 years and the most advanced state-based Republican party in the nation, he is building a platform of conservatism that has the potential to carry him all the way to the White House. But Ron DeSantis will not go unanswered and he will not become president, not on our watch. Movement Voter Project is organizing donors across the country and working with activists in Florida to build and fund a continued resistance to Ron DeSantis. We need a strong, well-funded and collaborative resistance that leverages the collective power of Floridians across the state the resistance will create a counter narrative, one that's sorely needed to define Ron DeSantis to the rest of the country and create content that can be utilized by partners in other states, particularly as uh, Billy mentioned earlier, in early primary states and general election swing presidential states who can then mount significant voter campaigns to persuade voters to oppose Ron DeSantis. We're starting conversations with partners in early primary states and looking to work collaboratively across state lines with our experts from Florida. So with that, I'm gonna start with our first question. And that question is for Andrea. Andrea, as we think about the last decade in Florida politics, what are the major trends and shifts that you've seen from a political and policy lens? And similarly, what role have you seen DeSantis playing in some of these shifts? Thank you. Um, so I'm an organizer. So I want to start with a quick organizing story. story. Um, Kyle. Um, Kyle is a veteran um, in Jacksonville. He is a single dad. Um, he used to be homeless and live in his car. And he would like wake up with a crick in his neck and like peel himself off the vinyl to like get to work. Um, and Pi Kyle, during the housing crisis that has um, skyrocketed over the last five years, um, is terrified that he is going to lose his apartment and become homeless again, um, that they can jack up his rent $500 from one month to the next. Um, and when we knocked on Kyle's door, he was really excited to join the Justice on Every Block campaign. Um, and he helped push in Jacksonville um, for us to establish renter protections at the local level. And just last month, Kyle joined over 100 of our members from 10 counties in Tallahassee and shared his story in House and Senate committees. And, you know, Kyle, I was talking to him after the day and he's like, you know, they, they're going to pass this bill um, to stop rent, prevent us from winning rent stabilization like we passed in Orlando this year that the Realtors Association litigated and blocked. Um, they're they're going to stop 60-day notice before a rent hike, um, but they can't take away everything that we've learned. 
And this weekend, Kyle and his daughter Ade are knocking on doors for a new mayor in Jacksonville, Donna Deegan, this weekend. And I share that like organizing story because Ron DeSantis, his attacks on democracy, his attacks on every issue we care about can seem overwhelming. Like the right, the massive right-wing infrastructure in Florida can seem daunting. And sometimes we can forget that they're really just co-opting organizing strategies. They're co-opting the strategies we have developed in Black and Latino communities, in working class neighborhoods, and they're investing in them over the long term um, to pull people along to their worldview, um, to hate and to division. Before Ronald DeSantis was elected, he was speaking at white supremacist gatherings. He was race baiting during his campaign. He uses power to consolidate power. Um, he under like when when we passed Amendment Four to give 1.4 people with felony con convictions their voting rights back. He did everything he could to undermine it and undermine their voting power. Um, gerrymandering maps, taking elected people uh, elected people who are elected to office out of office because of something they said, attacking groups like Florida Rising that does voter registration. Um, you know, so I think first it's really important for us to name like to those who think he is less dangerous than Trump or to people who think, oh, he's less likely to win. We cannot afford to underestimate Ronald DeSantis and organizations in Florida understand that better than anyone. Um, but what I want to emphasize is that in Florida, we are organizing um, every week. There are organizations that are going out and meeting people like Kyle and bringing them into our movements. There are student walkouts, there are marches, there are protests. There have been Wake Up Wednesday events every week across the state of Florida since legislative sessions started. And this week, I think I um, over 100 schools uh, have committed to doing high school walkouts and college walkouts. Um, and protests in multiple cities. Um, next Wednesday, the Poor People's Campaign is launching a, a four-day march um, from Havana, Florida to Tallahassee. Um, the week after that, towards the end of our legislative session, it's going to get real with escalated actions and as young people um, and, and others join them to say they can't ban us. Um, and next year, with your support, we will win an abortion rights ballot initiative. We can kick out Senator Rick Scott and project, protect a Democratic majority at the U.S. Senate. Um, I often remind our team that we're at the front lines. This is California during Prop 187. This is Arizona during SB 1070. And just because we're here now doesn't mean that we stay here. Like this is not our destiny in Florida. And I truly believe it's organizers who are going to get us to the other side. And I'm so grateful to MVP for sharing that belief and for investing in long-term organizing and local organizations and state-based organizations. Your support really means the world to us. And um, you're about to hear from some FIRE organizers. Thanks so much. Um, I wrote down a couple of things that I think really were resonating with me, that the right has been co-opting organizing strategies and investing in the long-term, that Ron DeSantis uses power to consolidate power, and that we cannot believe that Ron DeSantis is less dangerous we can't afford to underestimate him. Such powerful words. Thank you so much. I'd love to shift over to um, Josh. You know, DeSantis has proven himself to be a formidable opponent, but every opponent has their weaknesses. So based on the research and insights that you've um, uh, done at the com at your communications hub, to what makes DeSantis vulnerable, particularly with voters in presidential swing states? Yeah, that's a great question, Sarah. And I think Andre also set up well what I'm going to answer. I'm going to go into a little bit of some stuff like the right, uh, the rent crisis that she gave a really compelling story to tell about. That's a major issue we have here in Florida. But uh, DeSantis is uniquely vulnerable, both on economic issues, but also on social slash culture war issues. Um, he's basically spent the last five months uh, and really the last two years um waging a culture wars in the state to try to appeal to Republican primary voters in those early primary states like Iowa and New Hampshire. Those are voters that are out of the mainstream, right? They don't represent the average or regular American voter. Uh, and he's done this um, really, um, and it's really, these issues have major pushback from moderate voters and swing voters and, and voters of all race, color, creed. Um, and these are things like the near total abortion ban, the six week abortion ban, which he signed in the dead of night at 11 p.m. at night in a closed ceremony, not 
uh, it, to fanfare. If you know anything about DeSantis over the last two years, when he's so proud of something that he wants to tout, he shows up in a, a local community, does a huge event, gets a massive amount of earned media, and he signed this in the dead of night. It's not the first time this legislation session he's done that. He did that with the permitless carry bill, uh, a bill that allows um, um, someone to con uh, conceal carry a weapon without a permit, without training, uh, without a background check. This is a bill that's opposed by 70 plus percent of Floridians. We an issue that we know resonates nationally after all of the recent mass shootings in the country. Uh, after and and so we know there's vulnerabilities there. Additionally, he's been waging attacks on education from the Don't Say Yay bill uh, to book and course bans to attack on higher education, including banning DEI uh, trainings and um, programs, as well as taking over a college in Florida. Uh, really, a right wing uh, college. He wants to turn our new College of Florida, which is a small liberal arts school in Southwest Florida into the Hillsdale, Hillsdale of the South, which is really a scary idea. And then banning ma majors in colleges, including potentially banning gender studies. So why he's done all of this, uh, he's avoided, um, not avoided, but he's uh, let the affordability crisis in our state linger uh, while doing nothing to help out ordinary folks. Actually, he's given bailouts and handouts to the biggest corporations in the state of Florida. Um, and so Florida's actually become uh, the most unaffordable state in the country, which I think is surprising. I know there's some folks on this call from California and New York, uh, but the thing about Florida is our corporations don't pay a living wage in the state. Uh, we did pass a $15, million, minimum, $15 minimum wage a few years ago on the constitutional ballot, uh, which Ron DeSantis didn't support, but our housing crisis, uh, crisis uh, whether it's rent, whether it's property insurance, has exploded over the last couple of years. And we are now have cities like Miami that are actually more unaffordable than San Francisco, if you can believe that. So um, another thing that's happened here in Florida under his uh, time as governor, we've had property insurance rates double. Uh, they're actually three times the national average. And he's done all this while taking uh, more than $10 million from the property insurance industry uh, and giving them a $3 billion handout. Uh, Andrea really caught the story really good about our rental crisis. Over the last two years, we've had rent increases in Florida go up in our major cities more than anywhere else in the country. Um, and then we've also had basically a rubber stamp public service commission um, that is really uh, every rate increase that uh, utility companies have wanted over the last few years, they've gotten uh, usually double digit ones too at that. So we have his record as governor. He's got the culture war issues. His, attacks on social issues that we know don't play with a broad uh, multicultural uh, coalition across the country in our swing states. Uh, we have the economic issues here. Uh, Florida's become unaffordable. That's a story we can tell. It's a story that partners on the ground are telling every day. Uh, and then we have his congressional record from his time in Congress, right? This is a guy who was a founding member of the Freedom Caucus. So think Jim Jordan kind of guy, right? This is a guy who uh, supported Paul Ryan's budgets so we really have an opportunity to go back to the 2012 playback book. And if you think about that election, it was really defined on economic messaging um, that, you know, who was looking out for you and who, who they were looking out, right? This is a guy who voted for Medicare, Social Security cuts, as well as raising the retirement to 70 uh, years old. You'll actually see, uh, this is weird bedfellows, but the president, former President Trump, uh, currently running ads across the country hitting Ron DeSantis on Medicare and Social Security hits, uh, which is ironic considering Trump himself also supported those when he was office. But it does show that this is an issue that cuts across partisanship. It's not just an issue that works in a Republican primary or in, in, with Democratic voters. It works across the partisanship lines. In addition to that, he also voted to deregulate banks in 2018. Uh, so the recent banking crisis that you've seen, his hands are on that as well. Um, and then, um, obviously, multiple times when he was in Congress, he voted to repeal Obamacare, uh, which uh, includes a very popular pre-existing conditions protection clause. Um, and then he voted for $1.9 trillion of Trump tax cuts. So you can see there's a real opportunity to hit him on some of those really out of mainstream, unpopular economic issues, plus the earlier ones I talked about on social issues. The other thing he's going to experience is he's going from a really sort of controlled media environment in Florida. Um, over the last two years, he's really cultivated 
uh, these online small media um, organizations, the Florida Standard, the Floridian, uh, those are a couple of men, uh, mentioned, plus uh, Rumble, which is relocated to Sarasota, it's an online streaming services. He's not used to talking to press, not real press. Uh, Right-wing media, yes. Tucker Carlson, yes. Um, he's stepping outside of that sort of bubble that he's built for himself in Florida, this echo chamber. Uh, and he's, as you can see, I think over the last six weeks, he's taken some hits. His, you know, there's some, been some funny stories. I mean, the guy ate pudding with his fingers, right? Uh, <laughs> and so there's a real, you know, the real going through the grinder of being running for president. And then finally, he's a guy who lacks definition. Um, he's widely known nationally, but not well known. Um, and that really gives us an opportunity now before he files for president, before he runs either mid-May or June, uh, to define him. And I think we're doing a good job as a general overall ecosystem, both here in the state of Florida now, but also nationally. Uh, you'll see a lot of the narratives that organizers, groups on the ground are pushing um, that have started resonating nationally. And I think that's a real credit to really a unified message you hear from organizations in the state. Uh, and then you see national organizations picking up, um, you know, they talk a lot about the property insurance crisis we have in Florida, the housing crisis, the rental crisis. Ron DeSantis has run off for his presidential campaigns. I don't know if you know this, folks, but Fort Lauderdale was literally underwater for four days. Uh, and you see all of our folks growing in the same direction. You see national folks picking up on that. And I really do think, um, you know, not to be too crude, but we have an opportunity to kill his presidential aspirations uh, in the cradle, if you will. Thanks so much. Um, sounds like, again, the vulnerabilities I've, I've written down, you know, that there's opportunities to, uh, to attack him on the abortion bans, on gun control issues, on issues of economic justice and corporate responsibility, on DEI, all things that we know don't resonate with the majority of the country. Um, and that Florida has a unique opportunity to define DeSantis in advance of this run. Thank you so much, Josh. I am, I'd like to turn over to Ray, you know, as we look towards said presidential election, what is the Florida donor table and local partners doing to demonstrate the resistance to define DeSantis and to create that national narrative that can help to influence general election voters, particularly those who might be in presidential swing states? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, uh, I appreciate the question, uh, Sarah, and just a special thank you to uh, Movement Voter Project. Uh, I'm going to tell some hard truths today, um, but one of the things that I want to uh, lift up and appreciate is the strategic funders and aggregate funders who, despite a rough cycle last cycle, um, stayed with Florida. Uh, and much of what we're talking about today, um, while we did not raise, uh, while we did not raise the resources that I think we need to raise in order to be competitive. Um, MVP was there with us every step of the way. And I wanna send an appreciation to MVP, the staff uh, and their funders. For those who don't know, um, I'll be quick with it, but uh, the Florida Alliance is our state donor table. Uh, it's an organism, organization of institutional and individual donors who come together much like MVP and strategically, strategically fund. And so Sarah, to your question, what are we doing? I think number one, it's my obligation as Florida's donor uh, table director to set the record straight about what is actually happening in Florida. Um, I think that there is a narrative that has been going around uh, to some extent, understandably so, for the past 20 or 25 years, and folks have not taken a fresh look at Florida. And uh, ultimately, uh, similar to what Andrea was saying or Josh was saying, um, his rise has not been organic. Um, he is a product of the right, but he's also a product of the left's disinvestment and divestment strategy. Um, you don't go from winning by 30,000 votes to, um, sorry, my lamp almost fell. You don't go from winning by 30,000 votes to 1.8 million votes uh, by accident, right? There has to be a disinvestment strategy that's a part of that. And so um, setting the record straight about that, I think additionally, um, making sure that folks know he's worse than what you think. Uh, I've heard in circles and funder communities that maybe uh, Donald Trump would be a better president. Um, uh, Ron DeSantis is a white Christian nationalist um, and undergirding all of his policies is that overarching theory of change. Um, and it's not the change that we wanna see, but that is who he is and that is what he will turn the federal government into. That is what he has turned uh, the Florida state government into. I also think we have to set the record state that it's not just about preventing DeSantis from becoming president. Um, yeah. That should be 1A. Um, but if he loses, he'll still be 44 years old. 
and he'll still have the biggest war chest of any governor in American history. Um, he is not going away. And so not only do we want to prevent him from being president of the United States, but we want to prevent DeSantism. We want to prevent the rise of folks like DeSantis. And we want them to know that we may tolerate um, some things, but we will not tolerate what Ron DeSantis is doing. And most importantly, he's hurting us. Um, the progressive community, the progressive funding community um, uh, centers ourself on protecting those who uh, are vulnerable, who are under attack. Uh, and Ron DeSantis is deliberately inflicting, inflicting pain on Florida's most unprotected communities. And I think he's made the bet that the cavalry isn't coming. Uh, and what we've tried to do at the Florida Alliance with the dollars that we've had is let them know that, that, that that's not the case. Um, and so that, that's number one is setting the record straight in the funding community about what has happened in Florida, um, how Ron DeSantis will actually be as president and make sure that folks aren't taking him lightly. This is a man who folks said that couldn't win the primary. He won the primary. This is a man who was up four points, who Ron, um, uh, Andrew Gillum was up four points on. Uh, he won uh, the, the, the governor's race. And this is a person who went from 30,000 vote, uh, a vote margin to 1.8 uh, vote margin. He is not to be trifled with. Uh, he is everything and more than what people think about him. And then uh, to pivot to inspiration. And the truth about it is, um, as a funder, our responsibility is sort of threefold. One, to create funding alignment, um, to not uh, uh, pit organizations against each other, that when organizations are working together, we fund them and we get out the way, that we create spaces um, to, to, to aid uh, and to make sure that our organi organizers are resourced. The second piece, to be nimble. Um, this is a rapid, rapid uh, response program. Um, this is not something that we can sit on for three months and come back to. Uh, every single day he is harming communities and every single day our organizers on the ground in digital spaces and in communities, they need resources. And we're not always talking about a million dollars here or there, but you know, the freedom rides didn't happen by themselves. Somebody had to pay for the gas. Uh, the sit-ins, uh, somebody had to pay for the bail and we got to create a more nimble funding community at the donor table. Um, over the course of the last four years, the Florida Alliance has invested $36 million into Florida organizing and infrastructure. We have to do more. And we have to invest in our talent and infrastructure as well. Um, the folks that you see on the phone, the Quality Florida, Florida Rising, and the Communications and Research Hub are direct grantees of the Alliance, and we need to do more. And we need to organize more money to get them more resources so that they can get to scale. There's a misnomer that this defining DeSantis project is new. This is their lives. Uh, we're not going anywhere. There is no choice. Um, the folks that you see on this phone, um, the folks that you uh, are funding, uh, they are directly impacted by the terrible things that Ron DeSantis is doing and he wants to do. And so our, our obligation as a funder uh, is to create alignment um, to get out the way. The last thing I want to say is his dip in polls isn't organic either. Um, much of what you see, much of his vulnerabilities isn't just coming from the right. Um, what this resistance uh, when it has resources, has shown is that Floridians, despite the fact that he may have won by more, uh, uh, that he may have won uh, by many more votes this election, we're not satisfied. And, and ultimately, the state is not satisfied with his leadership, uh, and we're going to resist. And so um, our job is to fund, is to get out the way. Um, we are trying everything we can do to raise in the state to attract national resources. And I want to once again thank MVP for creating these spaces for Florida and for our organizers to highlight them. Thank you, Ray. Sorry about the lamp, guys. No. <laughs> I'm, totally, I'm trying to like, I'm on the road. I'm on the road, <laughs> I'm like figure out the lighting, but uh, I appreciate it. Thank you, Sarah. We're so happy to have you anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> And so I'm going to turn over to Nadine. So Nadine, we've been talking about the work to define DeSantis and your organization, Equality Florida, has already been doing this. As, as Ray just mentioned, this isn't a new project. You've been on the, been on the ground doing this work. Can you share um, with us some of the work that you've done in Florida to define DeSantis, not just in Florida, but beyond the borders of Florida with the Don't Say Gay and other campaigns? Oh, Nadine, you're on mute. I'm I'm new to this uh, Zoom. Hey, everyone, thanks so much, and, and thanks for the question because I think it's it's an important place where I hope that I leave people with hope that is built on the what we are already experiencing, right? And 
number one, I think it's important to understand that that backlash is evidence of progress. In fact, it's a lagging indicator that the culture has been shifting. And we have been in this kind of backlash before, especially when you look at the things that have been targeted at the LGBTQ community. You know, DeSantis is Anita Bryant 2.0. He's using the same Save Our Children, groomer language, all of that. And so there are things that we have learned from that past. Um, and one of the things that I think is critical to understand is that, you know, Trump and DeSantis are avatars for this existential fear uh, among a certain swath, a significant swath of white voters, that they are about to be a minority in a country whose demographics are shifting. It is the browning of America and the graying of America. And the reason it's important to understand that is because all of these culture war fires are, are linked to one another. Uh, the attack on trans kids has as much to do with Black Lives Matter protests against George Floyd's murder as anything else. And because we understand that the same ideological arson is creating all of these culture war fires, we are building coalitions that are unprecedented. You know, And that is critical to defining DeSantis in a manner that uh, doesn't simply derail his path to the White House, but serves as a repudiation of his policies and his rhetoric. And so the critical things that, that we recognize were one, stop his bad legislation, anything we can't stop, mitigate, build a coalition and define him. And part of building that coalition has also been tapping into this incredible wave of new activists and organizers. Um, these are folks who never thought they'd have to show up at a school board meeting, but now their kids are under attack. Books are being taken off shelves. Um, you know, they, their favorite teachers are being told we were required to peel safe, safe school stickers off of our windows. And there is a slow dawning realization uh, that is um, speeding up where people are realizing just how extreme, just how extreme DeSantis is. And so, you know, now we're out hustling them on the ground. We are overwhelming them at school board meetings, so much so that yesterday the Sarasota School Board which is dominated by Moms for Liberty. In fact, the head of Moms for Liberty is a school board member there. They shot down a contract with the firm connected to the Christian Hillsdale College because of the overwhelming local turnout. A Republican House member who campaigned as pro-LGBTQ and pro-abortion betrayed all those promises and tried to come to Miami Pride and rainbow wash his image. He was hounded every single inch of, you know, of that parade route with people booing him, holding up signs. Um, you've never seen that before. We've also built huge uh, new alliances at the national level. We have a situation room that includes you know, all of the key LGBTQ players um, where we are immediately sharing what we learn, white labeling materials so other states can use them, huddling with First Amendment groups, student organizations, abortion and healthcare access advocates, parents, as I said, that are newly emerging in the fight. And there is a wave of student activism right now that has to be supported and nurtured. They bring energy, they bring passion, and they rely on established organizations to help ensure they've got the permits, they've got the infrastructure in place. Um, but the, the, the impact of student voices, we saw it in Tennessee, we're seeing it at the local level. The other thing that I think is really important, I'm gonna drop these into the, uh, I'll drop these into the chat. You know, we've got to be more willing and nimble when it comes to developing messages and hitting them with messages. One of the pivot points for us was we took this gamble and invested like $35,000 into making two ads, one called Heroes that featured a little girl at the walking to the front of her classroom to give her speech. And it was supposed, supposed to be about you know, you give a speech about a hero and she decides that her heroes are her two moms. And and so this was an ad projecting what school would be like under the Don't Say Gay bill. And when it came out, they, you know, DeSantis went after it, said it was, you know, outrageous and all of these things. The two things that are important about that was, if anything, it was too gentle. It was too kind in in understanding what was actually happening in schools. But the good news was that ad, once it aired, we began to fundraise like crazy. We were able to keep it up in multiple markets. By the time this, the bill was signed into law, 
it had earned over two billion in uh, earned media, and it changed the character of the conversation. So I'm saying all of this primarily to say we are defining him as the the book banner, the censor, the history whitewasher, the extremist around abortion, and we are seeing those messages resonate. He he tried to bat back the uh, book banning. Uh, allegations by going on a press conference calling calling it the book banning hoax. But people are beginning to wake up. And I think you're seeing that in some of his um, potential funders who are now speaking publicly, you know, saying he's gone, con he's gone too far. Uh, you are seeing some folks who were considered in the bag endorsements for him um, uh, backing Trump. And so we really have to keep applying this pressure. The last thing I will say is that we are the front line of this fight. We are the perfect storm. We are the state where a sociopath and a narcissist are battling it out in the one and two position for, uh, for, for president. And I wouldn't want to be anywhere else. Right now, we are in an amazing moment of possibility. The marriage fight that uh, I'm, I'm a veteran of that war. And the irony was that they thought coming after us state by state by state would close the door and foreclose any possibility of marriage equality. And instead, what they did was they called a question. They raised uh, a fight. They brought the fight to us and people who never thought of themselves as political stepped into that. And so instead of just stopping the, the attacks on marriage, they actually accelerated the day when marriage equality became the law of the land. And similarly, this is the image I think it's really important for everyone to have right now. I, I, I tell people, imagine that this is a slingshot and they've grabbed that slingshot and they're walking it backwards. And with every to the world that feels most comfortable for them and most difficult for us. And our job is not simply when we break the grip that they have uh, to bring us back to where we are. What always happens after the backlash is we project further into the future, into a world sometimes beyond our wildest imaginings. And so our challenge right here is to use this time where there is no quick fix to build that unprecedented coalition, to create that irresistible vision for a future that is not based in the fear that has built the MAGA Trump DeSantis um, Republican Party, but one where everyone can see themselves. That multiracial future where everyone, even some of the people aligned against us right now, they have to be able to see themselves, their kids and their grandkids in that future. And that's the work that we have in front of us right now. And that's the work we're doing. We do not have to match them dollar for dollar, but we have to be resourced to, to get in the game. And so I appreciate everybody um, making time. I'm going to drop our links our fundraising links in the chat and invite anybody who would like to talk more granularly on strategy and tactics, uh, feel free to reach out. I'm happy to talk with you. Thanks so much, Nadine. I hope you all will join me in thanking our panelists for their time and talent tonight. We heard some really important things tonight that I'd like to recap before I hand this back over to the MVP team. First, we need to fund a strong and sustained resistance to Ron DeSantis in Florida. Without it, we have little ability to define and damage DeSantis, but with it, we have an opportunity to define him to voters all over the country and create content and persuade them to vote against him in his culture war, war conservatism. Second, second thing I heard, partners on the ground are poised and ready to take on this work and many have already demonstrated an ability to define and damage him. And third, even though our conversation today has been around Ron DeSantis specifically, what we're talking about is defeating every Ron DeSantis who tries to use this playbook in their future work. And so again, thank you, Andrea, Josh, Ray, and Nadine. You are on the front lines of this fight and for that and for so many other things, we are deeply grateful. And with that, I hand this over to my colleague, Jackie Kaplan Perkins. Oh, wait, I, I got to say something before Jackie gets in. And I just, I know we're, we're at time. And thank you, everyone. There's three quarters of the people are still on this call, which is amazing, an hour and a half in. And I just, 
have to say something. When people think about the group's MVP funds, people think lots of door knocking. And I want to add a word, which is genius. When you hear from Nadine and like th those quotes need to be over uh, everyone's refrigerators, what you said. And, you know, when Ron DeSantis named this bill, it was called the, I don't know, parental rights, blah, 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 blah. Equality Florida, Nadine's organization was like, no, no, no. We have a name for it. It's don't say gay. That is going to be the name of this bill in the public, which is one of the most brilliant marketing com strategic communications interventions, you know, in recent memory, which was done by a grassroots organization that nobody is giving credit for, who also are the ones who organized Disney to come out and 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 take this stand that they took genius genius and you know the i mentioned the minnesota model is this incredible model that we look to um when we create an mvp like we gotta spread this in other places it actually wasn't just the minnesota model it was the florida alignment model and the minnesota model together that were the the twin inspirations and the 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 deep collaborative strategic alignment that you all have created, which has been a model that's inspired so many states that that's, and, and Eric Bracken got a shout out, Florida State Advisor, um, who was, was the Javier of, um, <laughs> of Florida, who worked with this crew to, to, to create this as well. Um, so I just, you know, Ray mentioned the civil rights movement. Um, and I think that's really apt. There was a reason that you know Dr. King and SCLC went right to the heart, went to 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 Birmingham, where where they knew Bull Connor, you know, was was gonna do terrible things to to bring this forward. We have to see Florida and what's happening in Tennessee as on that scale of of terribleness that that we are building a mo and supporting leaders on the ground to build a movement around. So I just want to really lift that up. And just like we gave a standing ovation to Wisconsin and Minnesota, I want everyone to stand, please, and give a standing ovation to the leaders in Florida who are so inspiring, who are working through the hardest, hardest situation that is putting themselves, their families, their loved ones in jeopardy on the line just to do this work, going against this 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 horrible autocrat. We have to have your back. It is history will judge how we show up for you and how we show up for people all across the South and, and these red trifecta states, you know, where the the most horrific things are happening on our watch. We will stand with you. We will change this together. Um, and how we will do that is through donor organizing. And with that, I pass it to my colleague, Jackie Kaplan Perkins, who was just honored last week by the biggest LGBTQ center in Chicago. Uh, she and her wife for their incredible work over the years um, in Chicago. Passing it to you, Jackie. Thank you, Billy. Um, thank you for anybody, for the, the, those of you who are still staying on. Um, I will be brief. I am sitting here in the great state of Illinois in the city of Chicago and a proud Midwesterner. Um, we heard so many great things tonight. And I think um, I'm really going to take on Nadine's uh one of the last things she said about this being a slingshot and you can't even dream where you're going to, where that, you know, where this could launch you. Um, a, a year ago, just about a year ago, next month, um, Doran and uh, a number of us came together to, to organize and plot and plan for the Midwest. And uh, we heard a preview of what Doran talked about today, uh, a little bit of the timeline in Minnesota. Um, but when Doran told us that just a year ago, she was, um, she was determined, but sounded a whole lot more weary than she sounded today. Uh, and the energy and the excitement, and I don't think she could have, I don't think any of us who were sitting in the room that day could have dreamt uh, of all the accomplishments we heard 
uh, happening in Minnesota. I mean, we're not just talking about, as she said, a standard agenda. We are talking about a true progressive agenda. So as we like to say in Chicago, uh, well, I'm going to paraphrase what we say in Chicago, which is uh, in Chicago, when we used to be run by a machine, they would say vote early, vote often. I'm going to ask you to uh, join us, as, as many of you had, in giving early uh, and giving often to MVP. Um, we need this, you know, as you hear, we need the early investment. And um, and so I hope you will consider making uh, not only an annual gift, perhaps a monthly gift. Um, continue to join us in this fight. Uh, we're thrilled to have you as partners. And I will look forward to seeing you soon. And I think there's going to be links dropped in. And for those, and uh, we'll be following up with an email tomorrow too. So thank you all again for your partnership. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you, everyone on this call. Thank you, everyone who worked behind the scenes and the amazing MVP team and all of our amazing partners. Thank you for being here with us. And I want to end with a shout out to my mom, <laughs> which she doesn't know. This is a, a calendar that um, that's my mom in uh, the March on Washington, which little known photo. Um, come on <laughs> over here and just want to say thank you. We're, you know, this is, thank you, mom, for everything you did to, you know, to raise me and to do so much good stuff in the world. And, um, and thanks to all of our elders and, and all of our descendants who we are, are walking uh, together with. Um, go team. Like, we're going to just change history together. Like, we're going to turn Florida into Minnesota. We're going to turn Wisconsin into Minnesota. We're going to turn this whole country into some magical Minnesota stuff, you know? And so um, go team. And thanks uh, for the inspiration. And let's do this together. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> That's all. And thanks for staying on extra long, everyone. <laughs> Yay! Go team. <laughs>